Hello and welcome to this first Key Concepts video in the Philosophy of Psychology course. This is the week one video and here we're going to be introducing the idea of the history and philosophy of psychology. So we'll talk about these three disciplines this week and how they're interrelated um, in different ways. So the basic question we need to ask um, at the start of this course is what is the philosophy of psychology? And the truth is that a lot of theoretical work, a lot of work in psychology today overlaps with the more experimental and empirical research that's taking place in psychology and cognitive science. Right, so more experimental and empirical based on studies, um, based on case studies, um, based on surveys, questionnaires, etc. So a lot of the research in psychology is very sort of concrete and specific. Um, a lot of work in philosophy is very theoretical and conceptual. So in a lot of ways, um, as we'll see, these disciplines can kind of um, complement e each other. The, the, the work that's done in philosophy and theory um, helps us to better sort of drive the experimental and empirical research in psychology. And of course, the work in psychology helps to kind of check and verify um, and authenticate a lot of the work that's done um, at the theoretical level in philosophy or in sort of theoretical thinking. So questions like what are mental states and what is their relation to brain states are, of course, influenced by scientific developments in psychology, cognitive science and neuroscience. So today, when philosophers ask questions about mental states, uh, what kind of things are they? How are they related to brain states? Is there a one to one um, correspondence? Are they like functionally related to brain states? Um, when we ask these kind of questions, we can draw on the developments in psychology and cognitive science and neuroscience that have helped us understand the mind um, and how it works uh, much more, uh, much more precisely. And we can see this overlap at work in other areas as well, like ethical judgments. Uh, we can ask, how do minds make ethical judgments and how are they motivated to do so? So what roles do emotion and reason play in this process? Right, and of course, we can obviously get a kind of empirical um, take on this. We can ask people, you know, we can sort of question people and sort of put them in situations um, where they have to sort of make decisions and to see what do they rely on, how do they explain their decisions and so on. Um, so there's empirical work in this area, but of course, we also need to clarify the concepts. Um, you know, what does it mean to act according to reason? How do we characterize emotion? What counts as emotion? Uh, and what is its relation to reason and so on? And those kind of questions will uh, raise philosophical issues. So in all these areas, we're seeing the overlap and the kind of, I think, the complementarity we can say of philosophy and psychology that the sort of research that they do complements each other uh, very effectively. So why should we study the philosophy of psychology? Well, when psychologists talk about topics like human rationality, uh, are people rational? In what sense are they rational? Um, free will, uh, moral motivation, or the nature of mental phenomena like perception or belief, uh, or the structure of minds, they are often implicitly raising philosophical questions, right? So maybe not explicitly and directly, but there's always sort of philosophical questions in the background. So for example, when we ask something like, what does it mean to be rational? What is the sense of free in free will? How are minds related to the physical organ of the brain? In all of these senses, we're raising philosophical questions about what we mean by freedom, what we mean by rationality, and how do we sort of define that um, and oppose it to other sort of concepts um, and ideas like irrationality and so on. So we can see that many of the fundamental questions about human nature and cognition require philosophical reasoning. What is rationality? Right? How do we define it? What does it mean to be moral? How do we define the scope of, of moral action? As well as empirical research. So we can also ask questions like, are people actually rational? Uh, what motivates them to be moral? 
And there we can see the kind of empirical um, and sort of research questions asked by psychology can help us get a, a very um, precise take on these questions um, and to help us see whether the theory sort of lines up with what people actually do and how they actually behave. So we can see this interchange um, and the importance of sort of joining these two these two disciplines, especially when we talk about mental phenomena, when we talk about human rationality, free will and moral motivation. And these kind of questions where we're dealing with questions that are philosophical and psychological at the same time. Philosophy and psychology. Um, interestingly, were not distinct and separate disciplines until the 19th century. And before that time, psychological themes were discussed under the umbrella of philosophy. So we'll see that when we look at the theories of mind um, in the next few weeks, when we look at ancient theories like Aristotle and Plato, modern theories like Descartes um, and Spinoza, um, you'll see the, these thinkers are raising psychological um, issues about mental states and about the mind. Um, but of course, they were they considered themselves to be philosophers. There was no kind of separation of psychology and philosophy um, at that time. And that separation didn't happen until much later. So the history and philosophy of psychology um, is useful for a number of specific um, reasons that I think we can outline. So firstly, it provides a sense of perspective on current research issues. So if we're studying the mind, we can see how sort of current concerns have emerged from history and have emerged from the type of questions that people raised, type of concerns people had in history and how they were kind of transformed um, by new understandings and new conceptions. So students can also gain a deeper understanding of the subject matter by evaluating the significance of new movements in relation to the past. So here we can see how, say, new developments um, in a particular area, say a new theory of mind, um, relates to previous attempts to understand how the mind works or, or what it's made of or sort of what its sort of main functions are. And we can evaluate the new movements by seeing them in relation to the past. And I think that's that's an important way of understanding. Thirdly, it provides a valuable reservoir of ideas um, to explore topics and issues using non-experimental methods. Um, so here we can we can also gather up a whole load of sort of um, ideas and theories and and um, and sort of uses of imagination that might able us that might enable us to sort of go deeper into certain topics and to ask new questions um, and to sort of use our um, use our imagination to kind of raise new issues so it provides all these new all these ideas all this sort of range of ideas that we can sort of explore and use to understand um, contemporary problems and fourthly um, it might allow students to develop a personal identity in the discipline if we learn about the struggles of previous generations um, of psychologists. It helps us to understand, and it might help you as to understand uh, your own motives, your own motives and motivations for wanting to major in it, um, and sort of so give you a better sense of what psychology is from a historical point of view. Um, and that might help you to sort of firm up your rel relation to it. So I think in these kinds of ways, we can see um, some useful ideas. So to make sense of psychological theories and ideas, the idea is that we need to understand the social context in which they emerge and work. And of course, it's through history and using the tools of history and philosophy we can see how underlying social and economic developments and institutional changes drive the formation of psychological theories. Right? So an example of this is this book, uh, Young Vienna and Psychoanalysis, um, which is looking at sort of Viennese culture and the culture of Vienna at the turn of the 20th century to understand the the sort of birth and development of the movement of psychoanalysis, um, which is a very um, 
very popular and widespread uh, form of psychological practice in the 20th century um, and still ongoing today. But of course, we can ask questions about the time period. Um, you know, what were families like at that time? What were the prospects for men? How much freedom did women have? Um, and how did this influence the theories? How did this influence the sort of formation of the theory itself, um, the way that people lived and the context in which they lived and worked? So we can unearth those ideas using history and philosophy. And in doing so, we can see these sort of deeper social developments and institutional changes that drive uh, the formation of psychological theories. So let's talk about um, understanding, historical understanding, as we're going to be thinking about this um, as a main theme this week. One of the theories of historical understanding is presentism. And presentism is using uh, or is understood as using the standards and values of the present uh, to understand what happened in the past. So it's a kind of judgment where we sort of using our own values to judge the past. Um, and often this means that the kind of uh, the kind of ways the past is judged, it's deficient because it, it's not as it's not as humane, it's not as moral, it's not as insightful, it's not as enlightened as the present. Um, so we often sort of impose this value judgment uh, to understand the past. Um, and it's opposed to the idea of historical objectivism. So whereas presentism uses our own standards and values, in other words, the standards of our own time and place to understand the past, Historical objectivism tries to interpret the past from the perspective of the past. So it tries to get beyond our own values and to sort of look at the past as it is in itself. The only problem is that seems like um, a really difficult thing to do. How do we actually leave our own values and ideas behind? And how do we actually sort of get in touch with the past as it really was without using our own values, our own standards to sort of drive a, a judgment and an interest in what we're looking at. So this is where the um, philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer came up with the idea of a fusion of horizons. And the idea is that this corrects um, some of the faults of presentism and historical objectivism. And the, the main points Gadamer made here was that, were that we can't eradicate our own perspective from historical research. Our own horizon of understanding is determined by history. So, for example, today our understanding of air pollution or of disease is dependent on um, a sort of development and growth in medical understanding and sort of um, climate understanding and so on um, and how these things sort of affect human beings and their organs. So our, our sort of sense of these things is different than it was in the past. So when we approach other traditions, we approach them with the assumptions of our own tradition and things that we have sort of, the ways that we have sort of grown to understand things. The problem, however, is that seeking to understand a past society, um, or not a problem as such, but here something that sort of um, might allow us to get beyond the problem. Seeking to understand a past society might allow us to become aware of our assumptions or our prejudices. Um, so the idea here is that although we approach a past society with our own assumptions, our own prejudices, as Gadamer calls them, and he doesn't mean sort of, you know, uh, prejudices in the sense we mean them um, as in sort of racial and sexual prejudices. He just means prejudgments. So the kind of prejudgments we make about things based on our own values that we sort of carry with us. So in, in sort of in confronting a past society, it might make us aware of some of our assumptions. And in this way, we we successfully go beyond our own tradition to some degree and we fuse our assumptions with the beliefs of a very different tradition. So we sort of make we make a connection and we expand our horizon um, by examining a past society and becoming aware of our of our own assumptions, our prejudices, and sort of expanding our horizon to encompass um, some part of the sort of theory or society that we're that, that we're analyzing. And to do that, of course, we have to reflect 
on our own assumptions and sort of reflect on and alter those assumptions as we come into contact with the other sort of theory or the other society. Now, an important question when we look at history is continuity or discontinuity. So, for example, the history of psychology. Um, psychology, of course, didn't emerge as a discipline until the mid 19th century. But how would we describe the sort of the, the, the discipline of psychology in its history? Is it continuous or is it discontinuous? Um, continuity, we might sort of think of like the image on the right, where we're just adding another layer um, to a, an already finished building and we're adding layers, adding layers. Um, but we're not sort of changing or refitting the building. We're just adding parts to it. So can we think of can we think of the history of psychology like that? Is it simply do we just sort of add parts to it? Is it continuous? Right. Are the things that we believe today more or less like the things that people believed 100 years ago, but there's more to it. We've sort of added more pieces. Or have we sort of radically changed the way we think about psychology and the way we think about the mind and mental states and so on? The discontinuity idea we see represented on the left, where we've got different sort of buildings that are replaced in different eras. And it's like each era has to construct its own sort of psychology. Each era has to construct its own understanding of, of what psychology is and how it works. Um, so that's something we, we need to think about. How much continuity is there? How much discontinuity is there? Right. How much are, do we have to sort of reconstruct um, from the ground up um, in each sort of generation or whenever there's a, a radical change in how psychology is practiced? Thomas Kuhn uh, wrote a famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, published in 1960 where change in science is said to occur discontinuously. Um, so Kuhn was talking about change in, uh, in sciences like physics. And he says that changes, scientific change is non-cumulative and is driven largely by non-rational factors. So it, it's not like a process of addition where you just sort of keep adding and increasing your knowledge. But in fact, there are periods where the sort of things we think we know are sort of thrown overboard and it's almost like we start again with a new um, Kuhn called them paradigms. We start again with a new paradigm, a completely new idea of how science works. And that sort of drives research for a time before it's replaced in turn. So that's the discontinuous idea. We theories sort of persist for a time, say the theory of psychoanalysis, and then it sort of exhausts itself and it's replaced by something else. Now, we can see this idea of discontinuous history in Michel Foucault, the French historian, um, and the way that he uses the past and eras in the past to make us confront things about the present. For Foucault, the theories and structures that follow each other through time, whether they be, say, psychological theories, um, whether they be scientific theories, medical theories, whatever, they're not simply different, but they are incommensurable. So, for example, the things that psychologists thought at the beginning of the 20th century, sort of 100 and something years ago, are simply incommensurable with the way psychologists think today. In other words, you just can't compare them. They're not just different, but they can't even be compared by a yardstick because they don't have anything in common. So that's the discontinuous idea that we're simply living in a different age that we can't compare or we can't sort of measure against a previous age because it's just it's just so different and discontinuous from it. It's incommensurable with it, in fact. And we see a great example of this type of history in Foucault's um, book Discipline and Punish. Um, which is about the birth of the prison uh, system in the in the 18th century. At, at the beginning of, of the book, Foucault strikingly contrasts two forms of punishment. He talks about, firstly, the kind of torture and pain focused brutality that was common until the middle of the 18th century. And there's a particular passage 
um, on a, um, a man who tried to, um, it was a pretty pathetic attempt, but tried to sort of assassinate the king. Um, and in the, in the middle of the 18th century, the, um, you know, the sort of the punishment was the sort of pain sort of carried out on his, and the brutality carried out um, on this man's body was sort of the punishment that was executed upon him by the state. And Foucault contrasts that, which is a very much sort of um, body and pain focused uh, view of punishment with the system of correction in penal institutions, in prisons um, that replaced it. And we often, people often think of this transition and often describe this transition from kind of, you know, physical punishment and sort of brutality um, to confinement in prisons. Um, it's often described as evidence of progress, as though it's more humane, as though it's more enlightened, um, as people came to see that sort of torturing the body is, is sort of inhumane, is, is sort of immoral, and therefore it's sort of keeping people in penal institutions where they can be reformed um, is a more humane sort of way of doing things. And that's why the change uh, allegedly happened. Now, Foucault denies this, and he says there's not that it wasn't the case that this transition was any kind of evidence of progress or enlightenment um, or sort of increased morality of society. It was simply incommensurable with the system that came before it. And here's a key quote from Discipline and Punish where Foucault describes this new kind of regime of, of punishment as discipline um, that came to replace the sort of um, the old form of punishment as torture and brutality. He says, the judges of normality are present everywhere. We are in the society of the teacher judge, the doctor judge, the educator judge, the social worker judge. It is on them that the universal reign of the normative is based. And each individual, wherever he may find himself, subjects to it his body, his gestures, his behavior, his aptitudes, his achievements. The carceral network, the network of prisons, in its compact or disseminated forms, with its system of insertion, distribution, surveillance, observation, has been the greatest support in modern society of the normalizing power. The normalizing power is the way elements of behavior are rewarded or punished depending on whether they adhere to or deviate from a norm. So for example, a prisoner being allowed out of their cell if their behavior is compliant, they're punished by being deprived of sort of, you know, time outside if they're not compliant. But we see, as Foucault says, we see this e everywhere, right? Teachers have sort of ways in which they reward behavior and they sort of give elements of credit. Um, they have ways in which they might sort of um, punish or sanction behavior. Um, the doctors perhaps do the same thing, sort of rewarding patients for um, sort of behavior that keeps them healthy, right? So, so we've got a number of institutions that seem to be, seem to have access to this normalizing power. And what Foucault is saying is, is that it's not necessarily a more humane form of power than the power of torture and power of torture and brutality. It's just very different. It's incommensurable with that power. Here, the aim is different. The aim of discipline is to control the individual, right? And discipline operates on the mind as well as the body, right? It wants to. It wants the individual to become compliant, to do what the institution wants them to do. So individuals are refashioned to be docile subjects, to be compliant subjects by this far more invasive and totalizing form of power. And we can see this power, as we said, in hospitals, in prisons, in schools, in these kind of mass institutions that started to develop um, in the modern age after the 18th century. And all of them for Foucault have this sort of this idea of normality and embody this normalizing power that they're not, just, they're not just focused on the body of the offender, um, as was the case um, in the case of torture, right? But they're also focused on, on the mind. They're also focused on changing the individual, making them compliant and making them productive for the, for the way that normalizing power wants them to be productive. 
And a very um, uh, famous image that Foucault uses for this process um, is the panopticon. And this was a, a kind of um, a hierarchical observation technique that was used in prisons um, and other institutions. And the, the idea is that individuals are continually being watched from a central point. Um, there's, there's, there's an observer in the tower who is always watching um, the individuals who can't see each other, um, but they can see the, the authority that is watching them. Now, over time, what happens is that they begin to internalize the authority that watches them. In other words, it doesn't really it doesn't matter whether they're actually being watched or not, because they begin to anticipate the commands and imperatives um, of, of the observer. They, they begin to sort of anticipate and see themselves as being watched and anticipate the wants of the normalizing power and begin to sort of um, begin to work according to their imperatives. So hierarchical observation creates this internalizing, this internalization of authority. And that's key to the way that um, the new kind of power of discipline works. So Foucault's claim here is that we can see this, this new power of discipline is deeper, it's more insidious, it goes further um, than the previous regime of torture and brutality. It's not a more humane um, form of punishment, it simply serves other ends. And it serves, here we can see that it's, it's, it's not just sort of, it's not just punishing individuals in the sense of, of sort of marking their body, but it's making them into useful subjects, subjects who are useful for the ends of normalizing power, right? For the, for the ends of whoever's running these institutions and what they want individuals to do. Okay, so now that we've gone through the material and you'll have read the, um, the chapter by Walsh, which is the reading for this week, um, let me just run through the, ta the tasks to be completed this week. So there is a quiz, um, a 10 question quiz, which you'll have 30 minutes to do, and you can take that when you are ready. There is the hypothesis markup assignment. Um, and in this case, it's a passage by a philosopher called Gary Gutting on Foucault. In the, in the markup assignment, you have to leave three comments. Firstly, you have to comment on a passage, word or sentence um, in the assignment, in, in the sort of written passage. I also want you to ask a question about the passage. And I also want you to respond to a classmate. On the voice thread assignment, uh, the voice thread assignment this week is about Hans Georg Gadamer and the idea of interpretation. I want you to respond to the voice prompt and do a voice response to the prompt and reply to a classmate. And you can your reply to a classmate can be voice or text. Your response to the prompt uh, must be a voice response. So do a voice thread, a voice response, and a text a response to a classmate if you wish. Um, you can also do a voice response to a classmate, but text is good too. All right, so two posts uh, on the voice thread assignment. Make sure you watch the voice th thread assignment the whole way through before you respond because the prompt is right at the end. <laughs>